Dr. Kutcher, um, climate change is disrupting communities in Colorado and across the country in a variety of ways. What short and long-term solutions on the climate crisis has NREL provided and what's next for NREL? That we're, we're working on, on uh, various ways to improve the efficiency, lower the cost. Uh, we heard about Fort Carson Army Base, so as an example of a, of a near-term solution, uh, we developed a technology called Transpired Solar Collectors. It's a very inexpensive, highly efficient way to preheat the ventilation air that enters buildings. Uh, and so there's a, a large uh, Apache helicopter hangar at Fort Carson Army Base that has uh, transpired solar collectors on it. It greatly reduces the energy use uh, to heat the ventilation air uh, for that building. So that's a, an example of a near-term solution. Uh, longer term, yes, we're focusing on these grid integration issues that I mentioned. Uh, and I think Gene mentioned before, there's a, a future study that NREL did looking at uh, producing 80, 90 percent of our energy uh, from renewables by the year 2050. Uh, so we engage in those long-term studies. We also look at carbon payback. Uh, we, we do studies that looks at, okay, you know, any technology you use uses, produces some carbon emissions when you produce it. The question is, how does it do over the life cycle? Uh, and so we, we look at that as well. In my particular area, I work in the area of concentrating solar power. That's what my group does. Uh, that's different from photovoltaics. Concentrating solar power works more like a traditional coal plant. We basically uh, take the energy from the sun, we concentrate it, we, we get very high uh, temperatures. That allows us to boil water, produce steam, and run a steam turbine, just like you would in a coal plant. And the advantage of that uh, is that we can use relatively inexpensive thermal storage. Uh, I just visited a large 250 megawatt plant that's being built to, to provide power to Phoenix. It's being built uh, outside of uh, uh, Phoenix by Arizona Public Service. Uh, that has six hours of molten salt storage. And so even after the sun sets, uh, that storage, that hot salt, can be used to boil water, produce more steam, and get it onto the grid, and run air condition as well into the evening hours in Phoenix. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tignano, uh, the city and county of Denver recently adopted a sustainability plan that includes a goal of 50% renewable energy by 2020. Uh, what is the city's pathway for achieving this goal, and what is Denver's greatest challenge, and what plans do you have to address that? Well, just so everyone understands the new 2020 goal for energy, which we released on March 11, the goal says that by 2020, Denver uh, will be, still be using the same gross amount of energy that it is using in, in 2012, even though our population is growing at about 3% per year, and that, half, and that half of that energy will be from renewable sources. Um, the first strategy is that you have to pursue renewable sources and energy efficiency together. You cannot do uh, renewables without uh, also pr um, pr promoting an efficiency strategy. And when you think about it, if renewables are a certain percentage of our power mix and we reduce the amount of, uh, of energy that, that, that we use, then the percent of renewables constitutes can go up, even if you don't increase renewables at all. Um, in addition, I've already referred to uh, the fact that we feel that we need to lead by example. So in Denver, uh, in addition to our community goal, we want to double the amount of renewable energy produced uh, from city facilities by 2020. And finally, our greatest challenge is, you know, we use this 50% figure and um, it, within Denver, we are 100% supplied by an investor-owned utility, but their state mandate is only 30%. So to get to from 30% to 50% by 2020, we have to look at some other sources. Particularly, we have to look at what we can do in the area of liquid fuels. Uh, and that means that we're gonna have to really emphasize the switches over to biofuels, and not just biofuels, but the right biofuels. You know, corn-based ethanol really is not a viable long-term solution for, uh, for our energy needs. Uh, algae fuels, on the other hand, are of great interest um, to Denver, and I think they have great potential for uh, a community like ours that right now is, is relatively petro-dependent. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Gonzalez, low-wage communities of color are often more severely impacted by climate change and toxic emissions, as you mentioned. What do these communities see as the key issues, including economic trends, and what strategies have been explored for engaging impacted communities as well as other communities to solve these problems? 
So we hear a lot about community engagement. Um, I think that people, people are experts in their neighborhood. They know what's going on. They know when there's illegal dumping going by. We hear a lot about safety, about um, large trucks cruising through residential neighborhoods. Um, people are worried about their kids playing ball on the street. And I think that it's really key how engagement is done. So making sure that engagement is done in a culturally competent way. That when we go out and we want to know about air quality or we want to know about traffic or we want to know about transit use, that we're not just having you know, an English language only meeting at two o'clock on a Tuesday when everybody's at work. Um, but that we're actually having meetings that people can understand that they feel welcomed at, that they feel included at, because then you really hear about what problems people are facing and the creative solutions that they have to, to fixing them. So I think we're hearing mostly about the way engagement is done. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bassett, climate change is predominantly fueled by carbon pollution, which can be connected to many other toxic pollutants from fossil fuel use. What are the primary economic and health impacts of fossil fuel use and how will those impacts change as we account for their role in promoting climate change? So we um, recently released a report. If you go to Environment Colorado, you can look up. It's um, the cost of fracking. Because what is not being uh, properly uh, paid for is the impact that this is just one example, obviously. I mean, you could go with the cost of coal. Or, but it, we were looking at the broader health and environmental impact. Um, and I'll just run through quickly to some of the stuff that is not, you know, we end up putting the bill. So when a drinking water supply is contaminated, who pays for it? The community does. When there's water replacement, when there's water treatment costs, um, the damage to the natural resources, with the threats to the rivers and streams, the habitat loss and fragmentation. This is why I do this work, by the way. That sound you hear? I want to make sure we sell a planet that this little guy can live on. Um, <laughs> the uh, habitat loss and fragmentation, obviously as we're here today, the contribution to global warming. Um, the, but there's these broader economic impacts. We're seeing there's a, there's a community in Texas where the value of people's homes, they have this nice little community, they put all these drill pads 500 feet away from these homes. Guess what? The homes aren't worth anything. So who's paying when they decide they need to move, you know, for Maybe they don't like to smell methane gas anymore. Maybe they just also, you know, got a job in another state. Their house is worth nothing. Then you have um, health problems. Uh, you hear about residents who are near wells. So who's paying for their hospital bills? We've got a lot of worker injury, illnesses, and there's even been some deaths. Uh, air pollution. But again, it's just we're left paying the bill. And we have actually, the bonding in Colorado is ridiculous. These guys are getting on a free ride, and just in case you didn't know, they are exempt from the federal Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, and Clean Air Act. The coal industry is not exempt from those. Um, and actually, guess what? Most industries aren't. Um, so they have lots of free ride. And the final is the public infrastructure we're also seeing incredible road damage. Uh, you've got um, clean, you know, the emergency response needs, and then, thank God, this hasn't happened yet, but there are some states who've had to now deal with earthquakes. So those are some of the costs, and therefore why the actions are so necessary to diversify our energy base. Thank you. Mr. Weaver, Fort Collins has had municipalized electricity for maybe over 100 years, at least since 1937. Across the country, other communities like Boulder are closely examining the benefits of municipalizing their utilities. What are the benefits and drawbacks of municipalization as our energy grid transitions from centralized fossil fuel generation to locally owned distributed energy sources? Uh, I have to in inject a comment that because you have a diverse group of folks <laughs> with different interests uh, coming to this question of uh, climate and all. Um, we have a diverse set of questions that we've been asked to respond to, and uh, this one is, uh, is clearly on a whole different uh, plane than uh, in, you know, talking about some of the impacts of, of our fossil technologies and what have you. Um, Fort Collins,
Commons, as I've said, is a municipal utility. And as I see it, and as have observed how our organization has worked in the recent five or six years, um, I think the, you know, the main thing that municipalization or a municipal entity brings to a community is accountability. Um, in Fort Collins' case, and I'm sure in most instances, um, basically the board of directors of our electric utility is the city council. And so uh, policy that comes out of the community dialogue uh, at the city council level translates to the marching orders, if you will, for, for our utility decision makers. Um, in 2003, based on community uh, initiative brought to the city council, the result was an energy policy that said we will impose on the city of Fort Collins citizens, our utility rate payers, a surcharge of 2%. Uh, all rates would go up by 2%. Um, to cover initiatives in efficiency technology and renewables. Um, you know, most ratepayers don't like to see their rates go up. Most utilities actually don't like to be the ones raising rates because of the awkward conversation you have. But this policy was put in place, and in fact, the number doubled a few years later to support community efficiency initiatives, the rebates and things that we offer. Um, because it came out of the community and the accountability uh, passed through from council to the utility. So I think that's the main thing that a, a municipal utility does bring to it. And I'll say just real briefly, the dark side of that though is the utility often gets mired in local utility or local politics and that sometimes can slow down the policy implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Rural communities across Colorado are some of those most impacted by droughts and fires related to climate change. As a generation and transmission cooperative that serves 44 distributed utilities in many of the rural areas of four or maybe more states, what is Tri-State doing to mitigate its activities that contribute to climate change, particularly in terms of demand side management, energy efficiency, and increased renewable energy? Well, first I would just say that you know I don't think you can necessarily point at an individual weather incident and say that's related to climate change. And we're we're an, we're an organization that needs to react very quickly to things like a squirrel shorting out a power line. But we also have to think long term, plan. We have 40 year contracts. We have to look long term at our resource needs and our energy demand and react to that. Um, so we don't overreact to any individual hot summer or cold winter or five snowstorms in April. What we do um, is look at a long-term way to reduce our carbon footprint and to improve the wise and efficient use of our product by our, our customers. Now, in our case, our customers are not individual households and businesses. Our customers are our 44, 44 retail cooperatives. They then turn around and they serve people at the end of the transmission lines. So what do we do? We have a suite of um, several dozen products and services that we provide to our retail co-ops that promote energy efficiency, promote demand response management, allow people to reduce their electric bills by using energy at, at, um, at a smarter time of day, and then allow them to get rebates and discounts for investment in all kinds of irrigation, efficient motors, um, low income weatherization, ground source heat pumps, energy star appliances, like those of us in Denver might use. Um, last year, we gave out $1.3 million in incentives overall to our 44 co-ops and conserved 117,000 megawatt hours of energy. So it, it, we're providing these turnkey products and services that our members can use. And that's kind of on the energy efficiency and demand response management front. In terms of renewables, um, we actually just this past December opened a new 67 megawatt wind farm in Northeast Colorado. Two weeks ago, we announced the expansion of that wind farm to 91 megawatts. Uh, we have another 51 megawatt wind power project in Colorado. Uh, we have a 30 megawatt solar facility in New Mexico that at the time it was built was the largest of its kind in the world. Um, creates enough energy to serve 9,000 homes a year while displacing 45,000 metric tons of car carbon dioxide annually. As I mentioned earlier, one of the largest purchasers of clean renewable hydropower. Um, and then we have a, an aggressive program to encourage our member cooperatives to invest in distribution level 
uh, renewable projects at that level. And we have 30 plus projects in our system already. So those are among the things we're doing. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hanna or Ms. Frank, Fort Carson has launched 2020 net zero goals to achieve net zero water, net zero waste, and net zero energy. What steps have you already taken and what additional challenges are you facing with each of the three areas? Just to switch up the question, I will address the additional challenges first. Um, first and foremost, at Fort Carson, we are facing a culture change. We have two, um, two big initiatives. Number one, we have a bat culture, which is a big ass truck culture, where we have a lot of soldiers coming back from deployments and they wanna buy the biggest, best souped up truck they can buy and then they all wanna drive their individual cars as opposed to carpool because you, you just got a new car, you wanna show it off, of course. So we're trying to address that and how can we, how can we utilize carpooling. And then also a culture change when Net Zero came to Carson even um, even the professionals, I'm not sure if Jessica felt it, but I certainly thought, oh my God, net zero by 2020, that's only eight years, <laughs> now it's seven years away, and you, and you look at this and you feel that it's unattainable, but really it's not. Some of the initiatives that we address with net zero energy are, um, we are working with NREL for new technologies as far as um, passively heating and cooling a building, doing a dedicated outdoor air system, um, basically working with the climate <laughs> and, excuse me, specific times of the day to utilize the heating and cooling of a building and also um, hot water solar panels. That's an easy, low-hanging fruit where we get a lot of energy savings in addition to the more grandiose things like photovoltaics and concentrated solar power. Uh, net zero water was actually very easy for us to address at Carson, and I think a lot of that had to do with um, the culture change, or us being in Colorado, we understand that it's dry, and and that's naturally <laughs> ingrained in us. So, um, no flow urinals, low flow toilets, um, worked worked well for us. And uh, continue talking about the uh, the net, net zero water. I'll talk about the outside being the, the civil engineer and the team here, and um, and we're reusing. Talk about culture saying reusing all of our wastewater treatments. Uh, or the water from the wastewater treatment facility and um, getting everyone comfortable with that, using that for our irrigation water to um, water our turf that we need for, for physical training every morning. And we also have a net zero waste goal, which means nothing goes to the landfill. So we have to convince everyone to just choose not to per procure projects that are not recyclable. Um, we've been pretty successful at that, but you know, with our dynamic population, we have to re-educate everyone to make wise purchases and um, to reach that goal, but we're doing really, 